Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. A little more this way. You want me centered wherever you want me. How's this? There's a table here. How's this? All right. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Um, I'm John Cardellino. I'm the best and next manager here at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. And we are so excited this morning to be welcoming the Creative Mornings team, our wonderful speaker, and also people back in the library. So please give yourself a hand. Um, thank you all so much for joining today. Um, a quick plug on a few upcoming library events. Um, we have a few flyers outside, but we have a really a couple of really great programs going on here. Um, we currently have a Baltimore Living Archives project going on here at the library in the partnership with the Parkway Theater. Yes, and um, uh, the two artists in residence, Shan Wallace and Lawrence Burney, amazing. Um, they are both here as artists in residence doing two really remarkable projects. Shan is working on a project called Our City, in which Shan is actually on the second floor here at the library with a photographic studio set up, taking portraits, free portraits, by appointment for anyone in the Baltimore community. So if you're interested in participating in that project, 
There's information outside on these flyers here. And Lawrence, similarly, as a writer and archivist, is doing his How Did We Get Here project, um, in which he is also holding office hours in which anybody can come in and sit down for an archival interview with Lawrence. Um, we really love these projects. We really love these artists. And we hope that you'll all take time and come and engage with Shan and Lawrence um, in their artistic endeavors. Um, we also have a really lovely, uh, uh, as a part of our Brown Lecture Series, this Tuesday, May 3rd, um, the resplendent five-time <laughs> Grammy award-winning singer, activist, and humanitarian Angelique Kidjo will be here um, on Tuesday night, yes, yes, at seven o'clock. It will also be in person here at Wheeler uh, and we'll also be streaming it live virtually if you'd like to join us there. Um, and also, you're in the library today. I would strongly recommend, if you're interested, on your way out, please check, I don't know, check out a book. We have vinyl downstairs. <laughs> Just, you know, we're so happy to have people back in the library and it's so great to see faces and we're really happy to be, you know, um, presenting programs like this with wonderful uh, local cultural partners like Creative Mornings. Um, so without further ado, um, I would like to introduce the one and the only of the Creative Mornings team, Kira Wisniewski. How do I get out here? Hi. Good fall to morning, everyone. We're so excited for you to be here. Where do I stand, Henley? Oh, I sit. OK. Hi. Hey, hi. Um, my name's Kira. I am so excited to be here. And there's so many faces that I love. This is so, so, so great. So exciting. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, The Pratt. We're excited to be coming to you here. We're also streaming live right now um, in Baltimore City on the ancestral land of the Piscataway people. Uh, whose first time is it today? Oh, welcome, 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 welcome. We hope it's not your last. Um, who's not first time is it today? Welcome back, y'all. So good to see you. Um, you. It's been since February 2020 that we've been in, in real life together. And so it's just um, like a little, I haven't even had coffee yet. And I'm just feeling super buzzed right now. Um, <laughs> But also, if you're joining us online, we see you. So thanks so much for being here. Um, before we get started, though, I just want to say out loud, Black Lives Continue to Matter. Creative Mornings Baltimore is currently over uh, one of over two. Oh, I have a slide for this. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> One of over 223 chapters worldwide in 67 countries. Um, we're excited to be one of dozens of events happening today. We're also happy to offer ASL from our friend Brenda here, uh, who is from Hassa, supported by Eddie's of Roland Park. So here comes the, the underwriting. Yeah. <laughs> Celebrate spring with Eddie's of Roland Park. Their latest seasonally curated menu features classic favorites and new recipes, including buttery pancetta and smoked gouda scones, refreshing Thai watermelon gazpacho, and heavenly salted caramel brownies. Call or stop by to speak with an Eddie's caterer for your picnic party ideas. Details at eddiesofrolandpark.com. <laughs> Our Istanbul chapter chose this month's exploration of Kismet. Celine Sinar illustrated the theme, and MailChimp is the global presenting partner. All right. Each month, we like to give some more shine to someone truly special to the Creative Mornings community to read our Creative Mornings manifesto. And this morning, I'm excited to invite Sharana Christmas, a former Creative Mornings speaker, and hopefully you got to talk to her out in the hall about the New Generation Scholar Inter Intergenerational Institute, which is a free African-centered global educational platform designed for and by a collective of black youth, artists, cultural workers, and organizers. NGSII operates with the intention of shifting westernized conditions to liberate our minds and direct a radical unified path for learning. Please welcome Sharena. I don't know. I don't know. Sit there. Good morning, everyone. Good to see some beautiful faces. I'm so excited to be here for my comrade, Belfina Yuan. You guys are in for an amazing, amazing, amazing dialogue and engagement. So, oh, I don't. I don't. I got you. I got you. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, hopefully you all stop by screen, our but... uh, table over there. We have two of our legacy scholars, Solomon Ade and Simone. Um, 
Delphine is a co-founder of New Generation Scholars Intergenerational Institute. We operate with the intention of servicing Black people, adults, and youth ages 13 and up. And we just concluded our sixth course. We're offering free courses. Her course is next week, and I'm sure she'll let you guys know about that. And I want to give a shout out to Dustin, who also helps us with NGS. So I'm hey. really excited. It is on the screen behind you. Okay. So, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. So Creative Mornings Manifesto. Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action, honesty and hard work. We are here to support you, celebrate with you and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. Let me just say that again. We believe in the power of community and we believe in giving a damn. Yeah. We believe in face-to-face -face connections and learning from others and hugs and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. Yeah! yeah. Thank you, Sharina. <laughs> So Creative Mornings is run on an engine of generosity made possible by our volunteers and fueled by companies that believe in this community, people and companies that give a damn. Creative Mornings Baltimore is 100% volunteer run. So can I have all the volunteers just stand real quick? We did have yellow lanyards, but they didn't come in on time. But hey, yeah. Thank you. And I've said it many times before, but on a very personal level, one of the greatest things of working with Creative Mornings Baltimore is an opportunity to work with some of my favorite local businesses. So we want to give a shout out to Adorn Vintage Furniture, Hasa, Impact Hub Baltimore, Local Color Flowers, Maryland Art Place, Pixelated Photo Booth, and White Tea Company. We also want to thank today's breakfast sponsors, Eddie's of Roland Park and Black Acres Roastery. I also want to give a special little highlight so adorn staged our stage and all of this stuff is available for sale well not not the artifacts but we'll talk more about that so um you can take a chair home with you from this talk did you like wow right like this this pink leather chair is 175 dollars very affordable um the chair that i am sitting on is 155 but anyway i have pricing from reina on all of these things that's the most expensive thing up here just for for point of reference but um Happy to make a sale for Raina if you're, if you're interested. Uh, we also want to give a shout out to our global sponsor, MailChimp, that is supporting all 200 plus chapters. Uh, Anita and Arlene are um, supporting us with our online community right now, and they're dropping in the chat a link that lists all the wonderful sustaining partners that we have and folks we've been fortunate enough to work with since our reboot. If you can, we encourage you to support them more than ever. Uh, and if you can't monetarily support them, consider writing them a positive review or if you're not familiar with their work yet, go ahead and follow them on social. All of that is valuable to local and um, the local community. And you have an opportunity to be part of this engine of generosity. You can make a tax deductible donation right now through our fiscal sponsor at Maryland Art Place. So it's cmball.givesmart.com. Um, <laughs> hype it up, Mariel. Uh, where do all your donations go directly back into these events? So like giving you a very tangible example, StreamYard, which we're using to stream and we have throughout the pandemic, that's $25 a month that I've just been paying for. But <laughs> your donations go directly back into the events and any amount that is meaningful to you is meaningful to us. All right, enough of all, all that. Here we go, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Filipina Yawan is a Baltimore-based artist, archivist, and restorative practices practitioner born in Liberia, West Africa. Her work is concerned with the uses of memory for Black folks, how we inherit it, how we preserve it, and how we pass it down. She is a curator of her own online library, The Womanist Reader, and a collective member of the interdisciplinary publishing initiative, Press Press. She was Washington Project for the Art Summer Artist and Organizer in Residence in 2021 and recently launched Archive Liberia as a site of collective memory for Liberians. Creative Mornings Baltimore, please welcome Filipina to the stage. <laughs> nervous now so don't be a tough crowd um whew. 
I'm looking out there, I see my mama, I see my friends, okay. Um, thank y'all so much for being here. I'm so glad that you all took your time to be with me this morning. Um, before I begin, I wanted to bring my mom up here because when they told me of the theme of kismet, um, I remember me and my mom was on the phone and I was telling her and she was like, kismet, what is that? And I was like, do you remember when you would say, like, this is your portion? which is what you would say in Liberia and a lot of other African co cultures. And she was like, yeah, your portion. And so as I give this talk, it's important that there's context to the language I'll be providing um, in the cultural context of how we Liberians, um, my mom, we're Basa, understand kismet, um, because that is the perspective from which I will be speaking on, okay? And so my superstar mama, some of y'all done had her food. Some of you, if you haven't, you missing out. She ain't cooked today, though. She ain't cooked today, so sorry. Um, so I'm going to call my mom up here. Yes, girl. The fit is giving. You see the shoes? <laughs> Hi, mommy. Do you want to introduce yourself to the people? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So, um, my name is Trafina Goma Loitier, a Liberian and American, too. Who, whose mom are you? <laughs> Who's she? <laughs> Y'all hear more about that name. So, mommy, um, in Liberia, when someone is talking about your fate or your destiny, what how do they refer to that as in our culture okay so um destiny in our local tribe which is basso we say chin chin you're being yeah and then so if and then if you're telling someone um this is your destiny you would say this is your chin chin yeah yeah and i know uncle bobby is here too yes. she got it right yeah. uncle bobby <laughs> <laughs> and do you remember ever using that to reference me growing up as a child? Yeah. You know, um, actually, you were born during the uh, heat of the war. There was a bombing raid going on where we were at that time in Bonkani, where you were born. And the plane, there was a plane raid, and I fell. And you came like two weeks or a week earlier. So when you scream, the doctor look at you and look at me and say, oh my God, you got your hands full. <laughs> <laughs> this child, then I look in your face and with tears coming down my eyes and I said, oh my God, she's destined for great things. Aww. I said that to myself and I was just in tears. Mm. Thank you, mommy. <laughs> so y'all, I wanted my mom um, to provide that context because everything that I'll be sharing today relates back to that, my chin chin, my, my, my portion, right? You won't really hear me say kismet, but when you hear me say my portion, that is what I'm referring to, my destiny. Um, thanks, mom. <laughs> This is my favorite picture of me and my mother up on the screen. I always say if I was a rapper, I use this for an album cover because it goes, <laughs> ain't that a hard photo? Exactly, I think so too. Um, I still get on her because why my hair up there like little alfalfa? <laughs> Them big old bubbles in my hair. But I thought I looked cute though, so I love it. So for those who are at home, um, on the screen are two photos of me and my grandfather. Um, the one that is, which is to my right, um, is when I was younger um, with my grandfather in his chair. Uh, he was notorious for this recliner chair, okay? Um, if you came into the house and you got into that chair, the whooping was coming. It was not your chair to be in, okay? And then to the left, um, which is to my left, is once again him in a recliner chair. Um, this picture was taken last year's summer. 
Um, as I was playing and scratching at his hair, which I had always done since I was a child, he loves that. Um, and I put these sides aside because it shows how long him and I have been together. My grandfather lived the sort of life that would have you saying, life is truly his portion, life was promised to him. My brother recently told me a story that my grandfather told him that would confirm this. And so during the war in Liberia, um, my grandfather um, spoke a lot against the government at the time um, about what was happening to the people. And so he was arrested many times um, and he was also imprisoned. During one of the times, and he told my, my, um, my brother did this, during one of the times that the rebels had come to get him, um, they had him in a helicopter. So he knew something was up because they had put a bag on top of his face and they had him handcuffed, but he knew he was in a helicopter. And he said as they up there, he hear the rebels talking and essentially what they were gonna do was shoot him and throw him out of, that, out of the helicopter. Um, because they had had enough, right? This was not the first time um, that my grandfather had been arrested. And my grandfather says, as they take the um, bag off of his head to kind of be like, hasta luego, like you finna die, the gun gets stuck. And so the rebel is like, and his friends are like, come on, what are you doing? And he's like, the gun, I, I can't get the gun to work. And so after a few times of not getting the gun to work, my grandfather said the rebel looked at him and said, I'm not even gonna try to kill you again. It's not your time. And that is how my grandfather survived that. You see, he taught me what it meant to be all human, all complicated and all layered and all flawed. A hard man who demanded his expectations be met with no objections. A soft man who spent every afternoon in conversation with me, his elementary school granddaughter, reading poems and giving each other the gist of the day. We love to gossip together. I laid all the complaints I had from my mom to him and would pretend to be surprised when he would call her to fuss about what she had done wrong. Yes, I did. I'd be in the corner like, he called, really? Really, he said that? For any occasion, he would always request that I wrote him a poem because to him, writing would be my portion just as it was his. Y'all make fun of my baby picture, we gonna fight now. <laughs> I'm sharing some vulnerability here, okay? All right, these ain't never seen the, the laws. Um, for those who are watching at home, on the right um, is a baby picture. I'm in an all pink outfit uh, with uh, black polka dots and stripes. Um, and then to what is my left is me and my mom. I don't know where this outfit is. I would love to find it because she looks so fly. Um, and then it's me bald headed. I had no hair in the middle, y'all. I just had the little two right here, okay? <laughs> my grandfather gave all of his grandchildren play names based on how we were as babies. Mine is Pushy. You heard my mom call me that. You let him and my mother tell it, I was a fussy baby with a sharp cry. My mother jokes that she thought I would have a singer voice because of how much I cried, <laughs> cannot sing. I was also very curious too. Um, when we lived in Ivory Coast, one time my mom was telling me this story. Um, she had cooked a bunch of food. And if anyone Liberian in the audience, palm butter, she cooked palm butter and you know that the palm nuts, right? So palm butter get on anything, that thing finish, right? So she cooked palm butter, it's really red, right? So what I just said in translation is if it, if it touches anything, it's not coming out of it, it's going to stain it. And so after my mother cooked, she um, went to go lay and fall asleep. Apparently I was falling asleep next to her too, but I woke up. And she had arranged in Liberia, when you cook, you cook big. You got pots of food, plates and everything. So she had it out, letting it cool off. And I crawled from the bed and I jumped into all of the bowls, literally all of them. And she said she woke up and I was drenched in palm butter, okay? <laughs> when you go home, if you Google palm nuts, you will know exactly why this was a horrifying story for her. And so all the women in the community that she cooked the food for 
they looking like, where is the food? And my mom is stressed because now she has to explain that her curious little baby went in all of the food, put her fingers all in it, put it all up her nose, and there was no food. So I, I was curious at least, right? And with my curiosity came what Liberians will call a sharp mouth. In Liberia, they say your mouth is sharp. That means that you talk a lot, okay? <laughs> That's the nice way of saying it. I always had something to say and to add to everything as a child. I was audacious, even in the presence of those older than me. In kindergarten, I introduced my school, Isaac A. Davis, guest speaker during our graduation to first grade. My introduction was played on the local radios in Liberia, solidifying me as the representative speaker for my cousins during family meetings. And they still do it to this day. Whenever we're having a family event, I'm the cousin that has to speak. And so for those at home on the screen are two photos. To the right are, is an image of me and my cousins in Ivory Coast. Um, we're standing at the bush in front of our family home. I believe this was someone's birthday, and I only know because we coordinated our fits, okay? Um, as you can see, that's me in the denim on denim with the little thing in the, in the front, right? I just knew I was fly that day. That's my little big-headed brother who is sitting on the ground. You see that head, half of his body, right? And those are my cousins, right? And you could tell we were up to something that day, but we just knew we were cute with our denim on denim. And one of the things that my grandfather was very adamant about was that his grandchildren would be raised as siblings. He was very adamant that we did not see each other as cousins, but as siblings. And then on the left is a picture of me in Ivory Coast. I'm actually with my grandmother, um, who's in Texas right now. Um, and it's, I think it's somewhere near the house as well. And if you look in my eyes, you can tell I was ready to talk about something, okay? My mom said I was always telling on somebody. It's not my fault. I was recently sharing archival finds on Liberia with my little big brother, the big-headed one y'all just saw. And he told me, you've always been a collector of something since you were little, so what you're doing now makes sense. He was recently cleaning out my family's garage and he found a bunch of old composition books. So when we first came to the US, um, my mom bought me a bunch of composition books and then she would buy me like Junie B. Joan books and other children books and the way that she wanted me to improve on my writing and my English, but also because she knew um, that writing was my portion is I would rewrite all of those stories, right? So I have like, stacks of books in my parents' garage of me rewriting stories. And then I was also convinced I would be the best poet ever, so much so that I have a book called My Best Poems Ever. Um, and so my little brother um, saw those collections and said, you, you haven't changed. Like, you've always been like this since you were little. You always said this is what you would do. And so the two pictures that's on the screen to the right is a picture of me, my mom, and my little brother in our first apartment in Virginia. My little brother loved sucking his finger, oh my God, y'all. And we had to share a room at that. And all night long, he was going <laughs> <laughs> But I love him for it. Um, I do. And then to the left, I think this is also a really hard photo. I look good. Um, and y'all can see if any immigrants in the room, I'm holding on to the leaf. And when immigrants take picture for some reason, we gotta hold on to the leaf. That's how you find an African or Caribbean immigrant, okay? They're holding on to a leaf in a photo. Um, and this is me dressed up in front of um, our apartment in Virginia when we first came to the US. So me and my cousins, all my aunts and uncles, we all lived um, in that apartment. And so my curiosity, my sharp mouth, my writing, my collecting are all parts of my portion. All of these stories of my grandfather, of my brother, of my cousins, of my mother have been a part of my destiny, my faith. And as I come into this period of my life where I am now attempting to uncover 
archival history about Liberia. Um, if a lot of people don't know Liberia and Baltimore are sister cities, um, and so much so um, that there are a lot of streets in Baltimore and Liberia. Um, and if you went to Morgan, the Liberian president actually got an honorary degree there. And if you went to City, City actually had a Liberian museum. And so as I un uncover these histories about me and my people, it is clear even more that my portion, and it comes from Sadia Hartman's quote, is to remember what had been lost and what they became, what had been torn apart and what had come together. As I go through my curiosity and as I go through my collecting, it is even more confirmations of what my grandfather told me before. You would be a writer, you would be a speaker. Some of my uncles say, you're gonna be in politics, right? And so all of these stories have come together um, to create my kismet, which I've never used that word before, y'all, until right now, <laughs> my portion. So thank y'all so much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, we're gonna get into the Q and A now. So if you have a question in the audience, um, Sabina's gonna run around with a mic. Hey, Sabina. But also, if you are joining us online and you have a question, you can put it in the chat, and then I'm gonna see it here. Um, we're gonna try. This is the first time we're doing it like in both places. So we'll we'll see how this all goes, right? Um, hopefully, well and flawless, seamless. But I'll kick it off. Yes. So thank you so much again for, for being here and sharing with us. I know uh, I wanted to give some space for you to talk about some of these items that you brought. Yes. Today. Okay, y'all. So um, somehow, so me and my partner, I feel like now we have an entire museum. Um, he has been supplying me. He's been my Liberia supplier um, of collecting all of these things of home that's really important. Um, for those who know with the Liberian Civil War, so many Liberians, we lost a lot of our archives. We lost a lot of our photos. We lost a lot of our documents, right? And those are so important to a people's history. Um, and you now have 2022 where we're still uncovering so much about ourselves um, as a result of, and not only were those archives lost, but they were also stolen, right? And a lot of them exist here in the US. And so part of this is a rebuilding of my own personal archive. Um, and so I wanna show some things. Um, this is actually, this book here is from Cutington University, which is from Liberia. Um, they had a exhibit which was called Rock of the Ancestors. And the attempt of the exhibit was to be able to um, pay reverence to so many of the ancestral um, artifacts, objects of Liberia. So you see a lot of masks in here. Um, you see objects in here, right? And it was important to have this. This was done in the 60s in Liberia because it was an attempt um, of one, uh, reflecting indigenous Liberian cultures, which were stripped away, um, and to also create a compiling of history for people. Um, here you have the map. This is a pre-colonial map of Liberia, the Pepper Coast. Um, and that is important too, because what were we called um, before we were Liberian? What were the things around there? Um, and so, yeah, all of these objects, this book, Liberia 1970s, which have images um, that I had never seen before of Liberian universities, a kindergarten graduation. Um, they're a collection and an attempt um, for me to rebuild my own memory of home. Um, but also the hope is that other people can engage with this and begin to um, rebuild their own memory as well, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so another question that I'd love to just hear more about, um, you may have noticed when you were coming in, there was some music playing and that was intentional. It was a cure, it was, yeah. mama did that too, right? Oh no, I, oh, you gonna give her my credit? <laughs> sorry, sorry. I mean, she I helped though, she helped. Okay. But it, yeah. yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about the music that we heard when we were coming in? Yeah, um, in Liberia, before the war, they said normal time. So whenever you're talking about before the war, you said normal time, right? 
Um, and uh, there was music that I remember my parents talking about, music that I grew up listening to. Um, so many Liberian musicians and artists were owed so much, right? Because their careers were stripped of them once the war came. They flew to the US to exile, some of them passed away, whether it was as a result of war or as a result of like the impact of war. Um, and part of my archival research has been uncovering these artists, right? And, and a lot of these songs aren't on streaming platforms. And I'm grateful for those who are doing the work to put them on streaming platforms. Um, so not all of them are from Liberian artists. Some of them are just um, songs, whether it's Ivorian artists or Ghanaian artists, but you heard it at a Liberian party. And so in all of the work, I say it is a site of collective memory. Um, because as you listen to the playlist, it's literally a collective memory that takes me back to home, um, takes my parents back to home. When I tell my parents I sent them some songs, my dad would be like, what do you know about this song? Oh my God, yes, I was listening to this, you know, when I, was, when I used to go to the clubs. Or my mom, she would tell me, yeah, when I used to go dancing, this is the song that I would hear. And in that explanation, I find them almost time traveling, right? Um, and they're going back to that time and being able to relive those moments before um, the war happened. And so I hope with the playlist that one, people can interact with the culture and know that like Liberian music is very much so alive um, and has influenced other cultures. And so I'm, I'm kind of repping, but also for other Liberians, I want it the, for them to time travel. I want it to be a site of memory for them um, to hear these songs. So yeah, I'm gonna share the playlist. Make sure y'all listen to it. Yeah, we'll, we'll share it out too through our social as well. Thank you for, for curating that. So we have a question coming from YouTube and also I'm like trying to look at y'all for holding hands up too. But okay, we'll go to Sharina next. Uh, but first our question from YouTube is from Jermaine um, and he is asking, how can we support NGS and all of your amazing work. Yes, I'm glad you asked. So in May, um, so we recently launched New Generation Scholars Intergenerational Institute, um, which is an online institute for Black people of the world 13 and up. Um, so we have over 10 free courses that we offer online. And starting next week, Thursday, actually, I will be teaching a four part course. Um, it will be every Thursday from 5 to 7 p.m. And that course will explore um, the Liberia-Baltimore relationship. So we'll be looking at the Nat Turner Rebellion and the aftermath of the Nat Turner Rebellion was um, those who were not executed were sent to Liberia. And then also as a prompting of the Nat Turner Rebellion, the Maryland State Colonization Society um, was giving the duty by the Maryland, uh, the state of Maryland to essentially deport um, black, free black people from Maryland back to Liberia. And so this course I'll be teaching is absolutely free. We'll have information on how to apply and how to join. It starts in May 5th. Um, we'll be able to connect some of you all and also answer the question of, could you possibly have family members who are in Liberia um, or if you're a black person who are from Maryland, you might have had family members who were deported or went back and forth, right? So we'll be exploring all of this um, during that course. So we'll have um, flyers and so forth here. Um, yes, yeah, see uh, Solomon, Simone, or Sharena if you're interested in the Institute. Hey, yeah, go ahead, Sharena. Uh, I just want to say I love you and I'm so proud of you, uh, but also just the work that you're doing around Archive Liberia and just the history. Can you talk a little bit about, and I, I know some of the story, but just the transition to America, like how you came here, particularly, I think, in the 90s, right? And just what was that like, you know, just for your family and for you? So we came in the early 2000s and um, we actually, I was born in Liberia, but then my family moved to Ivory Coast during the war. So my mom mentioned I was born during the war. Um, and so most Liberians fled to neighboring countries. So whether it was Sierra Leone or Ivory Coast or maybe Ghana, um, and we fled to Ivory Coast and we were there for a little bit. Um, and as you all know, when, a, when countries are that close, the war tends to fluctuate in, right? Um, and so my family, after my grandfather, uh, who was essentially exiled from Liberia, um, he fled and then he sent for the rest of his, his family members. So my grandfather adopted over 32 children, um, right? And he brought almost every single one of them to this country with him. Um, and we came as refugees in 2001 
uh, started off in Virginia, um, and then 2006 moved to Baltimore. Um, so that's kind of been my migration and journey here um, that informs just like all of my story and what I'm interested in as well. Hi, friend. <laughs> um, so I had a question uh, because I uh, know that there's a lot of people talking about it. Um, a lot of us that immigrated to America come from cultures that suffered from war and the effects of what happens after war and especially like the loss of culture and uh, cultural archives. So for those of us like that did come from <clears throat> cultures that experienced war and have lost some of their cultural identity because of that, like what are the first steps that we can take to like begin that archiving process for, I guess, going back and, you know, recapturing those moments and, you know, that time machine thing that you were talking about. Oh. I love that question. Um, so I would actually say the first place to start is family members, if you can. Um, our, whether it's your parents or any elders in your family that hold so much, um, they can provide more context than history books or online can, which is why my mom, my parents, my uncles, my families are all my first source. Facebook too, y'all. Ooh, librarians are spicy on Facebook. Um, love it. Um, and so what I started to do was recording. Oh, man, I'm about to tell my mom the secret. I'd be recording you, mom. Sorry. <laughs> Informed consent. Um, <laughs> But what I would do is I'll call my mom the way Archive Library actually started. Like the first question I had asked her was, I said, what were you listening to when you went to the clubs? <laughs> like I was very curious. I was like, who was the artist that was like bumping during that time period? Um, and then I would ask her a question, like tell me the story of my birth. And then from that, she would tell me something about the place. And then I'd be like, oh, tell me a little bit more about that place. And then I'll go Google the places. I'll go Google people in those places. And then the story comes together, right? My mom's albums, like you might have, whether it's family photos, is IDs, um, whether it's jewelry, whether it's journals. Um, one of the things I think that institutions have done is taken away how we define the archives. And it's become very much so that the archives have to exist in these big institutions or these universities or within the, the academy when really the archives are any material that you have within your family, right? Your, your, your father's or grandfather's favorite hats, your, your grandmother's earrings, the jewelry that they wore, their recipes, right? Um, was there a, a handkerchief that they had? Those are the archives. Um, all of us have archives sitting inside of our households. We have our, our family members who should be our first go-to source um, because we know oftentimes like the history books and white supremacy and colonialism um, has taken away context, right? So to answer all of that question is our family. Inside of our home is the first place oftentimes that we can be begin building um, those archival source, which is why I steal all of my mom's stuff. I have her pots, I have her jewelry, I have her clothes. Like, mom, I need it for research, thank you. <laughs> well, yes, thank you so much. Oh, we do have to wrap up because of time. Oh, I'm sorry, but thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you for sharing more about you and your, and your in your story. Thank it's been you. such a true honor. Um, we'd love to see what this all looks like from your side. If you tag us on your social media of choice, it's Baltimore underscore CM. And then we also want to ask you to please save the date for next month where Will Walker is going to be talking about now. And that's going to be on Friday, May 27th. So thank you so much, you all, for joining us this morning. Thank you for being here. Um, any closing, any closing words? My uncle will actually have closing words. You oh, do. Oh, please. He will, he'll, he'll close that out. Stand up. <laughs> Good morning. If we were back home, I would say, be rain, yo, or be one, yo. Say it louder. Be one, yo. That's the same as good morning. I think one of the, one of the uh, legacy of 
colonialism or Western education on the continent is that the European that went there never learned anything about the people they try to take over. I teach one of the oldest languages on the continent. I teach Bahasa. Bahasa is not just your regular uh, or language. It's, it's all the way from, Abyss from the Abyssinia uh, uh, Empire back in 6500 BC. That's how old the language is. But uh, you, you bring me back to my, my young, younger day. I graduated from Cottonwood, by the way, 1982. And it just brings tears to my heart because right now the country is not what it used to be. People are now bathing outside. The kids got nowhere to, to shower. So I will try to give you as much information as I can for any area that you might think you might have a little doubt. I, I will be following your, your teachings or class and maybe putting in or taking out something that I think might be very beneficial, not just to the, uh, to the Liberian community, but to the, the community at large. As you know, I'm the president for the Vassal Association. Your mom here is my vice president. So it's a family affair, really. I really, really, I'm, I'm gratified to know that you are following that, the, a good example. Thank you. Because most people, when you tell them about Vassal, <laughs> the blasphemy, I don't want to touch that. But we have to embrace ourselves and we want people to like us. You can't castigate yourself. You can't be ashamed of who you are and you want people to treat you like a person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all so much. Thank you everyone for being here. We do have one more quick thing. We're going to close out with uh, a happy birthday to our former speaker, Alpha, who is uh, turning 27 this morning. And we have... Mario, we have a cake. We have a cake. <laughs> so thank you so much. Have a great fall to morning, and we'll see you next month.